Okay, so uh, welcome everyone to Denbydale Radio Club. Great to see you all and uh, good to have everyone here this evening. And uh, it's a pleasure to see you, uh, both to existing members of the club and to new members and new visitors. And uh, for those that are new to our meetings, and I'm just looking around the room very quickly, I don't recognise anyone I haven't ever seen before. Uh, one or two of you don't come every week. Um, as we keep saying to people, you are welcome whenever you want to come. So um, uh, any, any people who are not members of the club, you are very welcome to attend our, our online Zoom meetings whenever you wish. So um, tonight's talk is from our Tom, uh, ZT1T. And for those of you that are members of the Radio Society of Great Britain and haven't yet got this month's edition of RAGCOM or have got it and haven't opened it yet, uh, Tom has got a nice article in that on his uh, playing around in his back garden uh, with a two metre handy uh, to try and work through the repeater on the International Space Station. Uh, it's a ni really nice piece and, and well done Tom for, for a good article. I, mean, I enjoyed it and uh, one or two others in the club that I've talked to about it um, have commented on it as well. So. Well done, Tom, for, for that piece. Uh, Tom uh, is, um, this is Tom's second uh, talk to the club, and he did promise us when he talked earlier in the year that he would give us his talk on how radio uh, saved, I'm going to say their, our lives, uh, their lives, that's Tom and Sue. So, Tom, I think I'm just going to hand the microphone over to you, and um, uh, you, can, you can go ahead. So if you want to unmute, Tom. Okay, well, thank you very much, Nick. And uh, just before we start, uh, you'll probably see on the background, uh, the real background, charts on the wall, and uh, the talk will be intertwined with sailing, as you'll probably find out. Okay, well, thanks very much, Nick. I'm going to read it because it's a script. We're just going to we're going to share the screen. You should be able to see that now. Not not yet, Tom. Right. And there we are. Okay. No, we can't. We can't see it here. Have you got two? Have you got two displays there? No, no we just got the, the cards down there. Well, okay, Tom, 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 <laughs> uh, Tom, and, Tom and Sue. Uh, none of that is on the recording. So, welcome back to the meeting. <laughs> Lovely opening slide. I'm going to hand the microphone back to you, Tom. Very much. Uh, um, Radio saved our lives twice. And before uh, we get to the dramatic episodes alluded to in the title, I'll start at the beginning. Uh, back in 1980, uh, Sue and I decided to build an ocean going yacht. Yes, I know lots of people claim they'd like to, but Susan always does what she says. Yes, uh, our background, by the way, was offshore uh, racing, yacht racing. And I've been a four deck leader and uh, navigator in events like the fast net race and also skippered on the East Anglian circuit uh, over to Holland and Belgium. And Sue and I uh, used to deliver boats between races, unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, I should say, until our daughter was born. And so we built ourselves a mini tunnel. Uh, this is called Limbo and it was for sailing practice short handed. Unfortunately, when our son came along, as you can see him there in the cot or the uh, push chair, uh, we needed a bigger boat. Uh, so where does the ham radio fit in, you may ask? Well, planning to go blue water sailing means more self-sufficiency. And the list is quite long, but communications was high on the priorities and we decided to qualify to use amateur radio. Sometime when we were building the yacht, I visited Peter Acheson, uh, G3LSQ. He lived in Hampstead at that time, and he wrote the piece for Maritime Mobile in the operating manual. And I think the manual was uh, edited by G4TFTJ. Uh, uh, some of you will remember him. Anyway, Peter had this 40-foot steel yacht, and he had a backstay, which was a full wave on 20 meters, almost over a perfect... Uh, uh, ground because you know seawater is probably the best uh, ground you can have for an antenna that's vertical of course. 
Well, I was lucky enough to join Edgware District Radio Club and the members are a great help to me. And to be honest, uh, they did answer my questions, but uh, they thought or knew that I knew nothing. Anyway, I'll come to the dreaded Morse bit later. But our first station was modest on VHF. It was two, two oh, it was an FT207. It chewed batteries and you had to run it really in the battery charger. And uh, the first antenna was in fact a Slim Jim. And that Slim Jim is one that we still have. We annually trim the vines which seem to want to grow up it. Uh, unlike most handheld radios these days, the FT207 could actually be used in the charger, and that's a bit uh, of a backward step with the uh, things like the uh, bow thing. And my colleagues at work made me up a bracket at the handicraft, handy uh, craft department so I could run it in the car. Now, Coming to the Moors in London in the 1980s, or the early 1980s, uh, most people uh, knew that that was the ultimate aim to get on HF in those days. And uh, it was run by people like Ron, G4XPD, but his text was on from Danger Mouse. And then there was the other Ron, G3NCL, whose text was Earth Search by James Follett. And he was also a radio ham, by the way. And, but I do remember a G4 that did pieces out of the times, but I don't remember his call sign, I'm afraid. But John G3SJE from the Edgeware Club is one name I do remember because every Monday and Thursday he did sessions of slow morse on top band. Now, John's text was either from a book on cacti or dinosaurs, and the long scientific words relating to species and phenomena meant you couldn't second guess the words. John brought his interest to radio, as, you can, as I said, and he was dedicated two nights a week, every week for many years on top band till he passed away. Oh, for the record, Earth Search was originally a sci-fi uh, series on BBC Radio 4, and the book version follow, followed, and uh, all of Follett's books, as you know, were bestsellers. And sadly, we lost him on the 10th of January this year. So uh, very sad. G and his call, by the way, was G1LXP. Finally, on the 20th of June, 1985, after being G1CAJ, I was finally allocated G0CAJ. And uh, Sue picked up G1CAJ, and that's the call our daughter has. And she's due out here on Tuesday next week. Uh, Susan had an FT uh, FT uh, 480 for the VHF station on the top floor. Uh, we had a three-story townhouse, by the way. And uh, I put the 207 in the car, as you probably guessed. She did the CW on the last day that the GPO and maritime service offered it. And an examiner was the retiring head of section. Anyway, back to the preparing for blue water sailing. Uh, when you've got two children and you're funding the ocean going yacht that you've always wanted, money was tight. Fortunately, David Busby, uh, G4 HFL, uh, gave me a Hamiland 180. And uh, so I could listen. It's quite a nice radio, by the way. And they also had a switch that you could transmit at the same uh, when you uh, switched it over. That was probably very common in the old days. Anyway, down the hill from where we lived on Dollis Hill, uh, there was a radio station because I saw that an antenna and I popped in to see the gentleman. His name was David Godwin. And some of you may know him as the man who had the minimeter. Um, he said to me one day when I'd worked, I sat there listening to him working his friends in Greece. He said, would I like to borrow it? Well, I jumped at the chance. Uh, it was a bit difficult to work. But it certainly uh, did work for me. Anyway, the antenna was the doublet from the RAE manual, I think, at the time, and strung up to a neighbor's tree, and it had a wide-spaced feeder, which we called the bird's ladder. Now, I remember this drawing. It gave lengths of uh, this antenna that showed high and low impedance on various bands, but I've not been able to find it. And my first contact on 20 meters was with a G3 and a Victor 85. Uh, they were father and son, and they were very nice, but they must have realized that somebody had left a tyro loose on HF. I was so pleased, I told Sue, I've just worked Brunei. Well, I thought it was in the Middle East. Uh, then she put me right. 
Uh, fortunately, these days, uh, if I type a call sign into my computer, it tells me the country, which way to point the antenna, and so on. How things have changed, eh? Anyway, sadly, my mother died in uh, six months after setting up the separates, and uh, she was buried in a family plot in Wales. So uh, I bought an FT757 lineup, and uh, I operated from under the stairs. It reminded me of every time I was operating, um, well, I almost reminded of my mum. Uh, you can see I've changed the ATU there to another one because uh, uh, we had electricity problems in those days. And finally, the main station expanded upstairs into a built-in wardrobe at the main bedroom. And I say the main station because uh, it, that's the one that we, I used on a regular basis for all the different rigs. But Susan still had her station on the top floor. Uh, it was an FT7B and an FT480 fitted into a large airing cupboard on the top floor. Our son always went to sleep with mum's bee beeps. Uh, he was only five, by the way, when he decided to become a ham. And uh, one night, apparently, he called out a perfect CQ on 145500 using my call sign. Apparently, uh, he thought he was doing the right thing until someone told him or told me to stop messing about because they thought he was me. And then I was told to go back. And I went back to bed. Well, he went back to bed. And we only found out, oh, a couple of days later, I suppose, really, because uh, people were uncertain what to say. Anyway, there's the picture of Sioux Station. And uh, we never did take a picture of the main one. A skeleton followed by one with the boat and tent. Okay, during the summers, building of the yacht went well, although it took most of our holidays. And eventually we had a hull that we were fitting out and we camped alongside it and used the scaffolding to support a nine element uh, a VHF Yagi. Yes, I know we look a bit like gypsies, I realize that. Um, anyway, it was a great place, Canby Island, uh, flat as a pancake, and you could work uh, Wales in the morning and Europe at night using the FT-480. So you could have uh, Papa Alpha, Delta, Oscar, Oscar November, and France was very easy. However, the locals heard us, and they used to try and call the stations we were working. So one night, I was holding a frequency as usual, and I announced I was QSYing to 144300. Of course, I got there and said, would the Lima X-ray station go up to 350? Well, there wasn't one. And the locals stopped calling over the top after that, because if they'd gone to 350, they would have discovered there wasn't anything there. And during the winter operating, um, most, a lot of it was down at GB2SM. Uh, sadly, the year that we went sailing, 1995, it was closed down. And the last job, the Jeff Voller, G3FUL, he's still around, by the way. He had to dismantle his life's work. Very sad, actually. During that time, though, Sue and I got involved with the UK Maritime Mobile Net, run by Bill, G4FRN, another silent key. And we added a W3DZZ that was only three feet off, three foot off the flat roof. The roof was asphalt and not metal. And we monitored weather facts and marine transmissions. And before we left to go sailing, we were actually getting nav text from what used to be the USSR. Oh, nav text, as most of you probably know, is on 518 kilohertz. It's quite a low band. And there's also now a local band uh, for 490 uh, kilohertz. Anyway, some time later, I picked up with the Transatlantic Maritime Mobile Net run by Trudy, 8 Papa 6 Quebec Mike. And unfortunately, the W3DZZ was at the wrong angle uh, to be a really strong signal into the Caribbean. So I built a bow tie antenna, and this is development of the VK2ABQ antenna. I had three bands on mine, but it worked very, very well, uh, sat on top of a small scaffold pole on the flat roof. And then Susie bought me a lovely Christmas present, a Cushcraft A3 beam uh, for the station. I worked on 15 meters. Most of my DXCC submissions were actually on 21.355 megahertz. 
Uh, those were the days, eh? Unfortunately, the beam interfered with Sioux Station, so we had to organize a, a timing and set different operating hours. And we operated from home until we left. In the year before we left, I was asked to revise and rewrite uh, the radio section of Reed's Nautical Almanac, which is now no longer in existence, of course. Uh, for much of that time, uh, my job was an education advisor and often involved meetings and uh, directing courses outside of school hours. So I was able to nip home in the middle of the day and join the transatlantic net. But years later, when I ended up at my son's school as a governor, I managed to rig up an antenna on the roof from my office and classroom and help with the net most days. Uh, the children were interested and were very quiet and always keen to uh, ask later who was where, so we used to make a list. I think propagation was a lot better in the 1993, 94, 95 period. Um, I had a brush with Ofcom at one time. Uh, the yacht was launched in 1988, uh, 1989, sorry, and I was I fitted an FT757 into the navigation area. And it was a, a tri-band vertical on the stern, which uh, we don't have, didn't have in that picture anyway. And not long after mooring in the Medway, we returned to see notice of fine attached to the lifeline. It had been left by the Radio Communications Agency Maritime Division. And they claimed I'd installed maritime radio equipment without obtaining a license, which was an offense. I managed to track down the office and telephoned them and they weren't happy because I'd found them. So uh, I said to the uh, chap, but what proof uh, did you have of this despicable act? And as it happened, it was the officer who did the inspection. And he said, you have an antenna, so you must have a maritime radio. So I said to him, did you see it? And he eventually admitted he didn't. And I said, well, you've got a problem uh, because I've got a license that carries my equipment and it's amateur radio. So I asked for a letter to say that I hadn't trans, uh, transgressed, but all I got was a withdrawal notice. But at least I'd done the job and made sure that anybody else who came along would be able to see the paperwork. And during the uh, European cruises, we started to go longer trips as the, the years went on. And uh, we used to keep in touch with 5Z4BI and 5Z4 Bush Pilot in Kenya and John, uh, 9X-ray 1 Alpha Alpha in uh, Rwanda. No, sorry, 9X-ray 1 Alpha Alpha. Yep. And uh, we had a loop, for a loop for 20 meters on the back stays. Eventually we had an insulator up there with a vertical, a full wave vertical, just like uh, uh, the gentleman in Hampstead had told me. Anyway, there's an interesting story about John, 9X-ray 5 Alpha Alpha. He came to visit us in London on his way home to the US and he arrived on the 19th of December, 1998. I stood at the terminal, sorry, 1988, sorry. <laughs> I'm a bit previous. I stood at the terminal with all the guys waiting and they had cards like Mr. Smith and Cosmos and various other things. And uh, they kept giving me funny looks. And on my card was, Nine X ray five alpha alpha. Uh, let's, his call was nine one X alpha alpha. Actually, I put the wrong call sign up there, but it doesn't matter. Uh, they thought I was a competitor and asked me what the contract was, so I had to explain. Anyway, John came out uh, of the baggage hall and I drove him home to Dollis Hill. And although it was winter, he wanted to look at the uh, boat and also go to a real English pub. They always want to do that, the Americans, when they come to Britain, by the way. Uh, anyway, we got talking and I asked him, well, why have you come through London instead of flying straight home uh, from Germany, and uh, which was a, a stop on the way? And he said, uh, all the US personnel had been told to avoid the Pan Am flight that you, we all know as the Lockerbie disaster. Yes, they knew before it happened on the 21st of December, 1988. Anyway, finally, at 49 years of age, I took a year's leave of absence to go blue water sailing, and we visited several countries and islands, 
in the North Atlantic and headed towards Cape Town. On the way to South Africa, where Sue's parents lived, we kept in touch with Trudy and with Hank, a G0 FAB in Collindale, North London. But once down in the South Atlantic, comms to Blighty was not reliable, but we still managed to keep a scared with Hank. And the other groups we chatted to uh, were like Tony, WA2JUN, and Wayne, N0 United Nations, he's still around, and Jonathan, ZD9WRG, and sometimes Andy, as ZD9BV. Then one night, after we left uh, Salvador Bahia in Brazil, they persuaded us to visit Tristan da Cunha. And he said, it's on the way. Well, the 20 foot waves and the wind uh, abated not long after we sighted Inaccessible Island, which is the biggest island there. And we anchored with a trip line, not allowed to sleep ashore, just in case the wind got up. And it was my birthday, but we kept very quiet because uh, Tristan parties are renowned for being a uh, rather uh, good fun, shall we say. Only a small excuse is good enough. And that's the picture we had as we left Tristan da Cunha, as the sunset came, as we headed for Cape Town. And I got to Cape Town and was able to retire sitting in the Yacht Club bar. The part of the change of worlds was founding the South African Nautical Almanac and publishing. And this is one of the editions that we did. It's a two year edition every time. Now, but unfortunately, like all good plans, they never last forever. Our son Ian passed his matriculation and was accepted at Southampton Institute, as it was called then. So we sailed back because overseas uh, people Overseas students pay thousands of pounds extra for the privilege of attending a UK university, even though Ian is British. Well, what were the highlights on the way back? Well, the first was St. Helena, uh, where we were entertained by Bruce, Dead the Eight, Charlie Whiskey. And this is a photograph of Jamestown in the hollow, and you can see the yachts anchored out there in the, well, it's not really a bay, but it's a, a fairly sheltered anchorage from, uh, from the east. And that's the survey a vessel that comes in occasionally. And then we ended up going to Ascension. And this picture is of the eye of the wind. It's a training vessel. Uh, it's a wonderful place. Oh, by the way, our son pulled up seven fish in one cast. Um, when we were at Ascension, it, fishing was what you call easy. And then the second picture we have is of the US base, and they were still sorting out the runway after the Falklands affair. I still think they are doing that at the moment. And the last picture of it is Green, green Mountain. And this is the only bit of green on the island, uh, just to let you know. Anyway. Well, you do know, I suppose, that the uh, broadcast um, aerials have been taken down, or quite a few of them, and uh, now it's on a timeshare basis, uh, and I think it's run by Radio France International. Anyway, we were very fortunate to visit Fernanda de Rona, where we were entertained by Andre Sampao, that's Papa Yankee Zero, Fox Fox. Uh, apparently they now have cruise ships, or used to have cruise ships before COVID, come into Fernando, so that was busy. And the second one shows the main fishing fleet of the island up on the beach. We never did quite work out how they got them down to the water because ocean tide levels, as you know, are quite uh, small, uh, or the range is quite small. Uh, the third one is showing Andre's antenna farm, and that's a farm to die for. Unfortunately, uh, uh, we haven't heard him for some time. So I hope that I'll get to uh, speak with him once the propagation improves. Anyway, we picked up with Trudy's net and Hank was on hand and we were lucky to visit Trudy after a long voyage across the north coast of Brazil. And she was suffering from arthritis and shortly afterwards she took on another operator. But you know, interesting, she copied the weather forecast from Radio France International every day in French, and then translated it into England, into English, sorry, seven days a week. After waiting for wind to cross the uh, North Atlantic, we finally left St. Martin for the Azores, but the wind was light. There was a stationary tropical storm hovering to the east of Bermuda and very little wind elsewhere. 
Thanks to our son, who's a keen dinghy sailor, the spinnaker flew during the day and we made some progress, but still were behind schedule. Now this section's called Radio Saves our Li Saved Our Lives the First Time. At the time, uh, there was a guy called Herb Hingelberg who lived on his yacht Southbound 2 in one of the marinas in Nassau. Although Herb wasn't a ham, he was famous for his radio station that operated on a marine frequency. And there he gave out routing and weather advice, free of charge, seven nights a week. And we used to listen to him, but he always expected the yachts to travel faster than we could. And then one night, uh, he was describing a line score that he said would develop into a full storm. And we were on that line. Although it was flat calm, we reefed down the main and changed at the number three Genoa, donned our oilskins and sat in the pitch dark. Now, anybody seeing us would have had doubts about our sanity. But then at one o'clock in the morning, local time, our sunny Ian said, I think I can hear something. And sure enough, there was a distant roar that became louder and louder, and we were hit by a severe northeasterly wind. Fortunately, we were on the right tack, and the yacht took off, heeled over, and away we went. This lasted for about five days on starboard tack while Monica steered the yacht. Now, I ought to explain to you, Monica is actually the wind steering system, and that's the name the children gave it. It's a servo pendulum system uh, with a wind vane. Without Herb's information, we could have quite easily been in big, big trouble when the storm hit. The loss of the rig and no radio would have been a difficult thing and a distinct impossibility. Distinct possibility, sorry. Also, we were nowhere near a shipping lane, so I think that was the first time we owed our lives to radio. Plus, having the radio on the boat, you meet all sorts of people. One example was a, a guy on Trudy's net called Paul. And I don't remember his call sign because he was a pirate. And later we found out he was a smuggler. And he was the person who ferried drugs from the Caribbean to the UK. And when we talked to him, he was heading for Cape Town to escape the UK police. But they did eventually catch up with him at the Royal Cape when he was arrested. And for reference, his name was Paul Rogers, a journalist, author, and convicted criminal. And he used to write to me uh, from prison still claiming his innocence until I started to ask questions. Anyway, once back in the UK, we had a flat in Southampton on the 21st floor where radio was no go. So we concentrated on the station in South Africa. Although I did a few sessions on the yacht when we were in the boatyard, and I worked, one day I actually worked two aeronautical mobiles, one going into Athens and the other one over the US. But life in the UK and six months in South Africa running a publishing business in both countries wasn't ideal. But we did it for 10 years, but we operated only in South Africa where we expanded the radio, radio station. Eventually, we arranged for someone to manage the business for six months and we had the opportunity to bring the yacht back to South Africa. So we set off from Portland via France to Bayona, Spain to wait for wind to head for Madeira. And we always anchor at Porto Santo, that's the smaller island, before heading for Gran Canaria. And then it's south to the Cape Verde Islands, and they're not so verdant. The first photograph in this sequence uh, shows the colonial building in Mindelo, and the fresh produce market is in the ground floor. We were fortunate enough to meet Carlos, Delta 44 Alpha Charlie, and his QTH is in the middle of that picture. Uh, from then, we uh, headed to Recife and reached Salvador by Christmas. Although we had very rough weather to Brazil, we ended up waiting again for the South Atlantic system to develop after Christmas. It never did really develop, and eventually, uh, with frustration, we headed for Cape Town. It was quite slow. Progress was mainly south, where we should have met the westerlies. And one day we were sailing along and there was a dull thud on the deck. On inspection, the fitting that was holding the force day uh, to the bow had sheared and the weld was only around the edge. The bad news was that I could not get the sail down. We had a replacement and could have 
have repaired the four state, but the recoil in the foil uh, prevented the sail from being uh, pulled down. <coughs> so we wrapped the sail around the four stay and we roped it up and discussed what to do. And as the wind picked up, uh, it developed into a tropical storm. Now it's quite unusual in the South Atlantic and all we could do was sail downwind like the Flying Dutchman. Our track on the chart was like a very big circle. And for the record, after this, the Brazilian Navy Meteorological Agency started to name storms. And the first one they named was Ariani. Uh, Arani, sorry, developed a month later when four lives were lost and two yachts were lost. One piled up on Tristan de Cunha and the other on Gough Island. And both crews have run in for cover. Anyway, let's go back to the plot. I was in touch with the South African Maritime Mobile Net and Andy, ZD9, a ZD9BV on Tristan, but they couldn't help me with any advice. And after several attempts, they assessed the situation and the net controller contacted the South African Maritime Rescue Services. I'm gonna read you a piece from Tristan de Kuna Communication News. British yacht spray dust rescue operation. On Thursday, 24th February, 2011 at 8.30, Tristan Radio received a radio call from Tom Morgan on spray dust indicating that the British yacht was in distress and needed help. It had a broken force stay and could only sail downwind and might lose its mast. At the time, spray dust was about 800 miles west-northwest of Tristan. Emails were sent to the uh, centers at Cape Town, MRCC Argentina, Uruguay, Brazil, and the Brazilian Navy. The three Q crew of spray dust were rescued the following day and are reported now safe on board a tanker heading for West Africa. Well, I'll spare you the details of the rescue except for one incident. When Susie was tying up the bow of the yacht to the tanker, there was at least a six meter swell running. And as the yacht hit the ship, she bounced on a bottom. She finished the job and came back after the wheel. And she said to me, I think I've broken my back. And I said, don't be daft. You wouldn't be walking. Well, I got it wrong completely. She crushed one of the vertebra, one of her vertebra. And this was picked up on an X-ray in Cameroon, but not by the doctor in the uh, Lincoln General Hospital in England. And they both used the same X-ray photo, by the way. As she'd been lugging cases round and drove our car into Cape Town over 100 miles to change from the hire car and other things I won't go into. Uh, other, our local doctor took one look at the x-rays and she was with the specialist the next day, no waiting around. The orthopedic specialist said she'd, had, she'd been doing all these things for about two months, so she had a choice. Uh, being squeamish, uh, Sue went for the body brace and not the knife. She did so well that nowadays she digs the garden and pulls the ropes for antenna work. Now, during, uh, regarding the rescue, I should say, the appearance of the tanker was one off. It was going from California directly to Cameroon around Cape Horn. Otherwise, there would have been no ships in the South Atlantic that could have helped. The last transmission from the yacht on Channel 16 Maritime VHF uh, was because we could see the tanker on the AIS. That's an automatic vessel identification system uh, that transmits position, speed, course, and distance uh, to other vessels automatically and often the name. So you can sort of see in the fog, but that's not its purpose. If we'd not been on amateur radio, we wouldn't have been here today. And unfortunately, our rescue, uh, since our rescue, the South African Maritime Mobile Net is not operating. Many of the amateur maritime mobile nets all over the world have ceased to exist. I thank you for listening. Apologize for the uh, break in transmission, but radio saved our lives twice. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Tom. We really thoroughly enjoyed that. That was um, a, a lovely presentation. And um, Tom, I, I don't think you'll mind me saying this, but those members of our club who listened to Don Field, G3 XTT, when he spoke mm -hmm. at the club uh, in 
the beginning of uh, 2020, uh, managed to mention lots of exotic locations around the world. I think your talk has trumped his, Tom. I think you've managed to uh, mention uh, rather more exotic places than the ones that uh, Don referred to in his talk, where we were all green with envy. So uh, it was it, very enjoyable and, um, and, and a great talk. Um, I'm going to open up the discussion and see who wants to ask any questions to Tom, either on um, boats and um, what's it like sailing in the um, Atlantic um, or any aspect of radio. So who wants to go first? Yes, Roger. Hi, Tom. Thanks for that. Very interesting. Um, I wonder two things. What happened to the boat and how did you power the radio with a, when you were sailing all, all that for that length of time? OK, well, the, the, the yacht was abandoned when they cut the mooring lines off the tanker. Uh, there was no way they could pick it up. And we had battery power. Uh, we ran the engine every day uh, to charge, the, uh, to get the freezer cold. And we had three uh, uh, truck batteries. That's what we did. All right. OK, thank you. Right, anyone else with a question to Tom? If I don't see you straight away, then just... Oh, you're getting away easy. Good. <laughs> yeah, you're getting away easy, Tom. So, Tom, just I've got a question to you. What ex Exactly what were the radios you had on board the um, your boat? Uh, well, apart from the, uh, the FD757, we had an ICOM... Uh, 600. We actually had an ICOM 710 marine radio, but uh, I was using that uh, down here at the time for the amateur, for amateur radio. So we had the marine radio and also the amateur radio, as well as the VHF marine and the VHF uh, amateur as well. And did you just have the one antenna on board or did you have more than one HF antenna? Well, we had the backstay and the vertical for the for HF, and uh, for the VHF, we had a double five eighths collinear uh, with with uh, tuned radials, and that ran the marine as well. Great stuff! Very good. Um, right, anyone else with a question to Tom? Um, anyone green with envy and wants to go and build a boat? <laughs> Uh, G3VFC, good evening. Yes, go on, Terry. Yeah. yeah. Hi, Terry. Yes, hi to Tom. Um, I'm absolutely intrigued. You used uh, amateur radio uh, for your enjoyment of the boat. Uh, did you manage to work other people uh, throughout the period, or were you so busy sailing that you did not get your DXCC? Well... Um, the DXCC I did in London. No, no, no. No, from, from the boat, Tom. Oh, from the boat. Well, you're not allowed to do DXCC from there. But I did work a lot of stations um, on land, and uh, they were, people were quite interested in working them. We also worked quite a few other yachts in those days. And nowadays, the yachts don't have amateur radio on board. They have an Iridium uh, sat phone or whatever. So often they don't even meet in a crowd like they used to. Even um, maritime HF radios are not so common anymore. Oh dear. Mm -hmm. I would say that uh, we used it quite a bit for listening, uh, especially in the Caribbean, there were three or four uh, nets running that gave weather forecasts, which were quite good. Mm -hmm. Yes, the, yes, we talked to the, well. We used to talk to the locals as well, and uh, in the Canaries and in Brazil, we talked to at the locals. And quite often, somebody would come and visit you, and then uh, they'd you'd find out that their friend or their father or mother or whatever was a radio ham. It's quite good. So, amateur radio for uh, yachts or even sailors um, dying a death. By the sounds of it, no, I'm afraid uh, 
Well, they did resurrect the South African Maritime Mobile Net and it lasted about six months because that's as long as the season's concerned. And uh, they decided there weren't enough takers. See, people, people tend to phone ahead now rather than use the radio. There we are. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Terry. Yeah, not so much FT8 causing the problem, more these wretched satellites we've got going around the globe, <laughs> making communications just way too easy. As, uh, as I mean, which is ironic, given that Tom's just written the article about the uh, making contacts through the space station uh, with our handheld transmitter. No doubt he could have worked through the repeater on the uh, space station from his yacht in the Atlantic. It's quite interesting you're saying about that. I, I was down in uh, near Chichester at the weekend and having a little listen around and just nothing on maritime VHF either. It no. seems that nobody's using that. Even coming in and out of port. You have to use um, marine radio um, in Cape Town and Durban and Richards Bay to enter and exit. You have to have a listening watch. Um, mm. I don't know what it's like in the Solent these days. Not, no, I'm what? not sure, but I, I didn't hear anything. I mean, the most I heard was actually people shouting out of the lock to hear the people on the uh, on the quay uh, <laughs> as they, or, or sorry, on the boat, shouting out to people on the lock. Um, maybe maybe they should have used radio. One of the busiest places I've uh, come across uh, recently is going there through the Straits of Gibraltar. There's quite oh, yeah. a lot of traffic there. Oh, yes. Mm. yes, there's like a corner at uh, Corona um, in Spain. Yeah. And as you go around the corner there, that's got more traffic than the M1 in England. Yeah, there's, still quite a lot of, there's still quite a lot of marine FM radio going into the Thames Estuary, into the Port of London. Oh, really? And Yeah, and the Port of London Authority um, have got their um, radar and, and uh, big communication set up down at Gravesend on the south bit of the Thames Estuary, and they do still monitor and, and, and make contact on FM, mainly because there are quite a few small boats and small crafts and yachts that come in, and even nowadays, lots of them still tend to use, um, you know, FM to... Um, announce themselves as they come in. Mm. Yeah, still quite busy on the Umber as well. Mm. Um, you know, a lot of movement on, on Umber estuary and they use it quite a lot as well, FM. Mm -hmm. I think there's a there's usually a, a weather forecast and shipping forecast on, uh, I think it's um, channel 12 and 14, uh, about 2100 UTC. Mm. We here on the Belgian coast is still using and even on HF we have here in Bruges we have now a private HF maritime station. Wow. It's uh, yeah private and they seems to be profitable so they are dealing traffic and so on with ships and with yachts and with you know and they are on HF. And we also have Austin, Austin Radio which is from the state it's a public service but we also have that private station now in Bruges near the near the coast. So how do they make their money, Jeff? Uh, if you use the service, you have to pay. Okay. If you want to telephone or if, if you oh, want to send okay. a message, so you have to like pay. a message handling service. Yeah, 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 yeah. It seems to be profitable. Just a question, Tom. Uh, mm -hmm. I I think your boat was in was constructed in wood. It was not steel. And how did you do your grounding of of the grounding for your electricity and so on. Okay, well, the, the boat, um, what you saw was the skeleton and that okay. had foam laid on it. And then the foam laid on it and smooth, but then it was glassed over. Okay. And then that was all rubbed down smooth, turned over, and then you pull out the chicken skeleton and then yeah. you glass on the inside. And uh, you grounded the uh, radios using a, a sinterized bronze plate. Okay. Below the water <laughs> level, uh, yeah. and that also that we had uh, ano we had anodes on the engine as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That can be a problem. Yeah, mm. yeah. And you you have to you have to get the boat out of the water 
regularly to clean up the, you know, the because you have these little uh, bees who are on 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 yeah on the boat. So you have to do that regularly and and then paint it with that red red brown uh, painting. Mm. You have to do that regularly, I think, in every harbor. Anti-fouling, <laughs> anti yes. Yeah, yeah. We had a boat at home, and we had to do that two twice a year. Put the boat out of the water, and and you know, cleaning and and painting everything. Yeah, Tom, and I, I think a number of us were looking um, with some nostalgia at your your little bit through history, uh, the old mini meet mini meter transmitter that uh, came out, Gerald's nodding there, in the 1950s, was of course a valve, a mobile valve transmitter, to be clear about it. If I remember rightly, Gerald, you'll probably remember, I'm sure it was, we had one at home, it was something like a, um, a six AQ5, two six AQ5s in the final, and it gave about, it got that mobile transmitter gave about 20 watts output. That's right, that's isn't right. it, Gerald? Yeah, it's spot on, yeah, that's right. It's, uh, it's quite a powerful little beast in its day, for what we yeah. compared to the old ex-government things we've been using before. Mm. I had yes. a millimeter converter. Hmm. Uh, at an Edison 358X, and then I, I remember my mum and dad bought me a, a millimeter converter. And it was fabulous to go from, on the 358X, you know, a band was about an eighth of an inch wide and on the millimeter converter it's probably yes. about three or four inches it it was wonderful that was in the 1950s you want, i want to say to you david godwin actually uh, was the man who put television into what was rhodesia in those days it was the first in africa anyway weren't millimeter somewhere in london nick yeah northwest too they were yeah they i mean he did they, he originally he sold his company, didn't he? It went into uh, he went into audio, uh, audio and sound in broadcasting more generally. Yeah, um, and I, I can't remember who else. someone did buy the company out from him and kept it going for a little while, but um, it kind of faded out in the nineteen sixties. Um, the other thing I, I I smiled when I saw it, Tom, was the on that minimeter was the old Benning Lee connector, because uh, really? uh, uh, we, we, our, our shacks used to be full of those. None of these fancy um, N connectors or PL259s and so on. It was the old the old little Benning Lee connector that uh, we, we had box loads of. Yeah. Anyway, that was a fabulous talk. Yeah. Anyone, else got, anyone else got a, before we give our thanks to Tom in the usual way, Anyone else got a question to Tom about anything he's um, shared with us tonight? If not, can I, Tom, first of all, ask club members to show their appreciation, Tom, for your, your great talk. Thank you. It was worth waiting for. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Yeah. No, that, was, that was very enjoyable. And uh, I think we're all delighted, of course, that uh, you both survived. Um, and uh, of course, you also mentioned, I was going to say this earlier, you mentioned Canvey Island and one of the radio clubs I was a member of was based on Canvey Island. And, and I had a, a small boat there, but I would have struggled. Well, I struggled to get to Sheerness on it. Um, I definitely couldn't have gone into the Atlantic um, on the mm -hmm. boat that I had, Tom. Uh, and I would have been too terrified to do it as well. Uh, mm -hmm. getting, across, getting across to the Isle of Sheppey on a busy day on those waters could be bad enough from Canberra, <laughs> let alone uh, let alone taking it down into the Atlantic. Yeah. So somebody had a message about uh, Collindale. I was going there on Sunday, I think he said. Um, G zero FAB still lives in Collindale, and his number, his uh, address will be in the call book. All right. Okay. okay. Right, well, thank you very much. And uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to call it a day as um, up at six o'clock of five o'clock your time, very short, very shortly, you'll be two hours uh, difference. But thank you very much for letting me have the opportunity and good night. Thank no, you. Brilliant. Cheers, thank John. You, good night. Thank you, Tom. Good night. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom. Thank you.